It's so exciting to be here. Um, I've been on tour for three weeks, and this is my final appearance, and it's thrilled to be with you all and to have so many people who've made this incredibly beautiful book happen in the room. Um, and it's also particularly significant today is the first day of the Frankfurt Book Fair. And as many of you may or may not know, exactly 560 years ago, the first printed book in the world appeared in Frankfurt. And not only did it appear there, it was the fair itself was founded by the hero of my novel, who is Gutenberg's apprentice. And his name is Peter Schuffer. He was a real person, as was Johann Gutenberg. And the third person who brought this monumental book into being, which, who was a man named Johann Fust, who was the venture capitalist who made it happen. And all I really want to say before I read is that the novel is um, the fictionalization of one of the most important events in human history. I would not have ever come to it if I hadn't myself been a printer. My grandfather was a printer, and I apprenticed myself to two master printers in California. And they, they just instilled in me a love of craft, which I think I hope we'll talk about a bit, about uh, the process of making something from nothing. And um, as a printer, the reason that I came to it at all was that there was some research published in the New York Times in 2001 about what Gutenberg actually invented. And as writers do, I just tucked it away and went about my business. And then I happened to move to Germany. And I started looking into the story because this amazing, important invention transformed our world, but almost no one knows exactly what happened. We all know that the Gutenberg Bible exists. There are 48 copies still in libraries around the world. Um, it's the most important invention since the wheel, according to many different panels of historians. But the years in which this book was produced, 1,282 pages, are completely blank, which is a fantastic thing for a fiction writer. Um, and I think that I, I, the, thing, the most important thing that I learned in my research is that the story that we've all grown up hearing is really not true. We have this idea that the great man theory of history, that the lone geniuses are the people who bring innovation into being. And I think now that we live in a, a technological age, we realize that it's always a group of people and it's always a, tech, a collaboration. And so what, what I've come to think of the, the first years of printing as is the world's first tech startup because we had a venture capitalist, we had an inventor, and we had an artist who was a scribe. And, and Peter Schiffer is the person I chose to tell this story through. And I'm going to read to you a scene from the very beginning of the book. Um, the story turned out to be an amazing story. And as a journalist, which is the other hat I wear in my daily life, uh, I realized that no one had ever told this amazing story. Because not only did these three men come together to make this incredible book, it, it, it ended in tragedy. The entire partnership blew up. So I felt that it was just one of those, you know, incredible untold stories that was begging to be, begging to be told. And, and in the character of Peter, kind of through the writing, I wouldn't say at the beginning, but it, through the writing, I began to realize that he was some a way I could articulate my own ambivalence about our digital transformation and kind of explore the wonder and the fear and the uncertainty of a massive technological uh, transformation, because there, there are many, many parallels. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say. The, the scene that I'm about to read um, is from Peter's own storytelling. He's, he, the story is a frame within a frame. He tells his story to the abbot of Sponheim, who was a real person, to whom he did tell his story in 1485, in fact. Um, we know that because Trithemius wrote a chronicle and said, I asked Peter Schiffer how printing came about. So I took this small piece of information, like many writers are magpies. You know, I took all of the little puzzle pieces and I tried to create a, a human story. And, and so Peter is telling Trithemius' story. He had been in Paris as a young scribe, which he in fact was. And he, he was summoned back to Mainz, which is the city on the Rhine where he grew up. And, and Johann Fuss is a merchant, and in those days merchants also um, dealt in manuscripts, they dealt in goods of all kinds. And so we don't really know the relationship between Peter and Johann, but there was a close relationship. And so in my telling the story, I think that he was his foster son, that they had a relationship, a filial relationship. 
Um, and Peter received a letter from his father in Paris that says, you have to come home. And like any 25-year-old, he's not too pleased. Um, and he has to ride home for three days, basically, to get back to Mainz from Paris. And sit through a dinner. And finally, in the evening, they're sitting in the courtyard of a very nice merchant home in Mainz. And it's September, which is quite warm still, in the Rhineland. And his, his, his foster father, Johann Fuss, says to him, the feast of St. Matthew is auspicious for all business ventures. Fust's teeth were gleaming in the torchlight. Peter waited, long legs stretched out from the willow chair. The heat of the day had left the air of the courtyard warm and scented by the rose. And from the lane beyond, he smelled the tang of fruit, the thick, hot earthiness of livestock. He heard the call of owls, the inter intermittent roar out of the gaming house, those old, familiar sounds. What do you mean, he asked, when Fuss did not continue. Just that I have a proposition. His father sat upright, which I may not refuse. And this is why you called me back? We have a chance to shape the future. Fust leaned forward, peering at him in the dusk. You and I together, I mean. I shape the future now, said Peter, straightening. Not quite like this. I haven't had a chance to write to tell you. Peter spoke as though he hadn't heard. But I've been asked to join the rector's office at the university. Ah, said Fust. Imagine how the trade could benefit, his son went on. I'll see them first, whichever titles he selects. We'll know exactly what the market will demand. The last time Fust passed through Paris, he'd asked his son to act as scout, to scour the stalls where books were sold across from Notre Dame, to keep his ears pricked, and so learn the titles that the firm might sell to buyers east of the Rhine. Peter, meanwhile, toured him through the scribal workshop, one of dozens serving that great university. He showed him all the stacks of sections written out by hand, then lent to students who would write out their own copies, hundreds of them, not only by the Greeks and Romans, but the greatest scholars of the day, Duns Scotus, Bernard of Clairvaux, Thomas Aquinas. Those ink-stained scribes were like a mighty army, Fust had marveled, ranks of angels on the move. You said you envied me when you last came to Paris. That's true. His father pulled the flesh beneath his chin. But that was all before I met this man, this most amazing man. Peter made no attempt to disguise his scorn. Look first. His father reached into his lap, brought out a set of folded sheets, and laid them on the table. Just look, and then I think you'll understand. The choir, five folded nested sheets, was a parchment of middling quality, part of a school book, judging by its short square shape. Peter recognized at once the Latin grammar of Donatus. He had written out those declinations a thousand times. A common, tawdry work, he looked up horrified. Feel, his father said, and flipped the booklet to its last blank page. He lifted Peter's finger, rubbed it lightly on the empty space. He felt a stippling, a kind of roughness on the hide, as if the parchment maker had not scraped the skin entirely smooth. He rubbed two fingers, three, and all at once they sensed a strange, sharp symmetry. He flipped the page back to its written side. His blood jumped then, his palms grew damp. The textura lettering was squat and ugly, yet every string of letters was unnervingly even all across the line. Each of those lines ended with an utter chilling harmony at precisely the same distance from the edge. What hand could write a line that straight and end exactly underneath the one above? What human hand could possibly achieve a thing so strange? He felt his heart squeeze and his soul flood with an overwhelming dread. You see now why I had to call you back. Fust's voice was high. What work is this? What hand did this? No hand. His father took his fingertip again. Feel how it sinks, the way the ink lies not on top, but in a hollow in the skin? Peter closed his eyes to sense it more precisely. It was as Fust had said. The parchment yielded in some way. It was not smooth beneath the ink as when he wrote it with his pen. Whose work is this, he asked again. Fust's heavy face was shining. This man they call Gutenberg has found a way to make the letters out of metal. He lays the ink upon each one, then stamps them in the page. Peter raised it to his eyes, so close that he could see the faint depression, a slope so slight as to be almost imperceptible, from the surface to the gully of each stroke, the space in which the angels, or the devil surely, danced upon a pin. He could not speak at first, the shock was so extreme.
Hello, I'm Sina Nasland, your other reader uh, for this evening, and I'm introducing you to my novel that has a long double title. <laughs> the name of it is The Fountain of St. James Court, or Portrait of the Artist as an Old Woman. <laughs> so, um, this is my uh, ninth book, and um, it has uh, an echo from an earlier book. You know, when you set about to um, write a novel, partly the subject chooses you, and partly you choose the subject, I, th I think. When I wrote a novel about Marie Antoinette titled Abundance, there was a woman who was a painter, her, her favorite portrait painter, named Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. And I um, noticed when I was researching Marie Antoinette that all of the portraits that I liked best were by the same person, by a woman, which was extraordinary in the 18th century because then, as now, women don't have quite the same advantages that men have for fame in any field. So I um, looked into her, and she had dictated her memoirs to her nephew when she was up in her 80s, which was unusual for someone from that period to live so long. And in those memoirs, I found someone that I too resonated with, as Alex was speaking about. She had some sense of resonance with that main character, although those characters are very different from us. So uh, I was so interested in Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun that I abandoned Marie Antoinette and read everything in existence that I could find about the painter. But I was under contract to write a book on Marie Antoinette, so of course I had to return to that. And I, um, I did that, and I wrote an, another novel called Adam and Eve, and then I was looking for a subject for uh, number nine, and Elizabeth Vichy Lebrun haunted me. She wanted me to come and, and write about her. But um, back in the old days, when I wrote short stories, I always wrote contemporary short stories, things about the people I knew and myself and life as I experienced it all around me, and I sort of wanted to write a contemporary novel. Then the great idea occurred to me to combine the two uh, impulses. So the part called The Fountain of St. James Court is in fact a contemporary novel about a woman writer who has written nine books. I didn't have to do a lot of research <laughs> because she lives, I let her live in my house and I let her have some of my furniture. Of course she's not me. Of course not. She's a creative, fictive character. But um, She's just finished writing a novel, and that novel is about the painter, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. It's midnight, and she's uh, taking the manuscript, the first draft, across the street for a friend of hers to read, which is one of the first things writers do, is to ask a trusted friend. I have one of them here, Julie Brickman, also a writer herself, who always reads my work and gives me all kinds of marvelous advice, and I try my best, usually, to take it. I never take all of anybody's advice, but I always take some of everybody's advice. So that's how I came uh, to this material. But there's also another um, experience in the background. I've traveled a lot with novels and spoken to many different groups. And many people have asked me the question, where do you get your ideas? I think that's a very good question, but it's one that's impossible to answer in short order when you're looking into someone's eyes for 30 seconds. You can't give a truthful answer. So I wanted to pursue the idea of how art and life are related to each other, and by including Portrait of the Artist as an Old Woman in the Fountain of St. James Court, I hope to show how, of course, people who are serious writers draw from their own lives about the subjects. The subject calls to them partly because it resonates with something inside them. So in a sense, the book is a very long answer to that question. Where do you get your ideas? <laughs> so, um, I'm, um, oh, I also should mention, of course, the portrait of the artist as an old man is a little flip flap, but you know who? Uh, James Joyce, who wrote Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. That book was published uh, serially about 100 years ago, starting in 1914, and it provided the icon for how the next 100 years really regarded the image of the artist. Who is an artist? Well, he's a young, rebellious, ambitious, angry man, young man. And I thought, I want to try to write something that's needed. I want to write a portrait of an artist who is a woman, and not one who is young, but an old woman, who are, you know, they're 
we're very bad off in society, old women are. But, and not one who's just full of ambition, but who's actually accomplished something. Let her be the icon for an artist, an old woman who has her granary full, as John Keats might have, might have said. So, Alex and I are going to be sitting up here later. We're, we're glad to, we're going to chat with each other, but we'll also be glad to answer any questions you have for either of us uh, individually. Let me get on to um, the business of reading to you. I'm reading a portion from the painter Elizabeth Fischer de Brun's life. That's her self-portrait, or I should say detail from her self-portrait on the cover of the book. But the part I'm reading is of her as a child, living happily with her parents in uh, Paris. She was born in 1755, died in 1842. So we're going to join her as a little girl. She's gone to church with her mother. She's looking around at the church. The stained glass glory of the church of Saint Eustache draws close around me while my mom approaches the communion altar. A splotch of red light falls from a high window onto one of my shoulders, like a little red cape. But the redness is made of light, and if I place my hand on my shoulder, then the back of my hand becomes a large rose petal. Thus I play with the light and listen to the reedy sighs of the organ. Hovering high above, there are colored patches of sunlight like angels. I would like to see a real angel. It is not impossible, my mother said once, looking at me hopefully, as though she would very much like to be the mother of a little girl who sees angels. She showed me an engraving of Bernini's statue of St. Teresa of Avila, and also told me the name of the sculpture, Ecstasy. I hear myself say the word out loud now. I was not sure then or now just what it might mean. But I sat in the church of St. Teresa and remembered St. Teresa is a grown woman remind, reclining when the angel visits her. He points a spear at her ecstasy. The low foot pedals of the organ croaks like frogs in the country. And I turn to look at the painting here of John the Baptist because the blue color behind his head has as much brightness as any of the stained glass, though light does not shine through it. This painted sky is my favorite patch of color in the entirety of Saint Eustache. The face seems, as I look at it carefully, mobile. It cannot be mobile, but the painter has suggested that it might be. I stare hard to memorize it, and when I am home, I shall paint it myself from memory. When I look until I think I understand, I hear myself make a little gasp. The effect comes from the shading, from the way definite and indefinite shapes have been worked together. At home, because Papa has gone out, I timidly say to my mother, perhaps I will not take my little brother, Etienne, for a walk after our luncheon. I would like to stay home to paint. They are so happy that I almost wish I were going to be part of their happiness on their walk, but inside me is the happiness of preparing to paint, like a golden plum, but warm. Carefully and slowly, I get all the things that I will need, and I arrange them exactly so. I want the light to be similar to the one in Sanostash, the natural light, not the stained glass phantoms. I will not paint Nurse this afternoon, but because she is still, I study her. Nurse's face is turned away, her head resting on the back of the rocker, her breathing quiet, her cap bunches prettily on her head. I cannot raise my table easel very high, but I want the angle to be as much as it was, as such as it was at the church. The painting of St. John glows like an ember in my imagination, but I want to fan that ember into a new flame, my own vision. I'm excited because I do not know exactly what my rendering of St. John will become. After I chalk in the outline, I rest a bit to refresh my eyes. I study again the sleeping head of Nurse, the very slight change that is made in her features as she breathes in and out regularly. Part of me is idle, gathering energy, almost dozing. Then I assemble my brushes, a bouquet of flats and rounds, but now I must close my eyes to what is present and remember even before I begin the mixing process. 
Absolute quiet in the house is delicious to my ears. I realize I have forgotten to put my smock on over my dress, but I do not want to risk forgetting, and I decided to proceed. I start with our saint's eyes, for the center of the eyes were painted with the greatest precision, but now I only position and suggest them, and I work as rapidly as I can using my favorite round. Because the hairs of my favorite have a bit of snap to them, they return to place after use, and I feel pleasure, pleasure about the competence of my tool. It's almost frightening how stroke by stroke a companion comes to life at the tip of my brush out of the sized linen. My hand has almost become my brain, and it knows more and dares more than I can think. I think this is not art, but life that I have quickened on my little canvas. I want to make the face live, and it almost does, but I am half afraid of the saint and what he must think of me. I know what to do. I'll give him a modern collar. He will seem like an ordinary man, a Parisian. Now he is mine and no longer belongs to the church. The collar is very easy. I've looked at those of Papa and his friends dozens of times to understand how they're constructed. But this new face floating up from the woven threads of the canvas, covering the threads, still has something of a holy glow to it. And then I know something shocking that no one has ever said to me. Life itself is holy. I remember drawing in the mud with a stick. The Bible says we are made of clay, but it does not say we are holy. But how can it be otherwise? Life is the holy glow. I feel very frightened. I look at my hand that knows so much and moves so surely, almost without my will. My hand is full of life, and what I am doing is holy because it lives. I put down my brush and cover my eyes. I am trembling. I am sublimely happy. After we have had our light supper, Papa returns with three of his friends, and one of them is the painter Doyen. Mama sits close, listening and sometimes commenting. I like all of Papa's friends. I watch for those moments that bring their features together in a way that I could almost call harmonious. Everything changes at the same time. The eyes, the corners of the mouth, the angle of the head and the tilt of the chin, certain lines around the eyes and mouth. At last, there is a little silence. But Papa has not yet brought out his pipe, though he is reaching for it when I say, Papa, would you like to see what I painted today? Immediately, he is all attention. His eyes and skin and alertness tell me he cares more about what I have said than anything he has heard from his friends. He takes his time in replying. Nothing is hasty. He looks directly at me, already proud, and the light comes into his eyes, the slow smile of invitation and delight begin together. What do you have for us, Elizabeth? All of the men have stopped moving. They are inspired by the quality of Papa's attention. And also, I think of them as my friends, even though they are grown up and I'm just a girl. It would be difficult to paint them as a group, but for a moment they are completely still, waiting as though they could be painted. Mama puts her head, her hand most kindly on my back and says close to my ear, please do show us, Elizabeth. I lift the canvas off the easel and carry it by the edges in such a way that Papa will be the first to see it. He stands up, waiting for me to present my work. My painting is not very big. I tilt it up for him to see, and he gasps, just the same quick little gasp that I have. My child, he says, and both his hands are gentle on my shoulders. I have said it, and it is true. You are and ever will be a painter. He looks straight into my eyes and back to the painting and back and forth. I watch his eyes fill with tears of amazement, but he knows. Pleasure pierces me like a spear to the heart, like ecstasy. His words calling me a painter are a spear, a wreath, a crown settling on my head. I feel both its lightness and its weight. His friends all jump up and crowd around. They shake my father's hands and touch his shoulders in congratulations. Some exclaim, speechless Doyen embraces my father. When the painter finally speaks, he says, she has the gift. And all of them become silent. They do not touch me. My father sits back into his old leather chair. He gathers me into his lap and puts his arms around me, still holding the rigid square of canvas. I turn the painting so that my mother can see it too. But Etienne, my little brother, has already gone to bed. I know.
know the face is not really the face of St. John, because after I changed his collar, there were some other touches to make him more like my father's friends. What pleases me most is the shade of blue I put behind his head. Though the face and the way it seems like a real face is what seems important to everyone else. In the morning, I will talk to ATM about how I made that glowing blue. So. That was wonderful. Well, so much for reading. And I have to say that I enjoyed and admired your book so very much. I thought it was a unique book, nothing quite like it, and one that was needed for some of the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, we too are on the precipice of a huge change in the way our culture is transmitted, and you caught that moment that has haunted us for over 500 years and what you did. And I love the story itself, and I love the characters, and the complex and rich characters in the book, and, and the many wonderful ideas in it. So, I just want to say that up front. I thank you very much. much. I think you thank did a great you. job, and this is her very first book. This is her yeah. debut novel. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was very struck by how both of our readings were about craft. Yes. And I thought that was an interesting um, parallelism. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, since this is my first novel, it's your ninth novel, but they're both historical novels. Yes, they are. And you haven't always written. You've, you've done contemporary work, and, and as I've done contemporary work, and I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, what is what is the difference? What do we gain in terms of insight or value from looking at figures from the past as writers? What's, what do we? What, what's what can we get from them that makes them so appealing as fictional exploration? Well, I think there's a different answer for every character to whom we uh, respond, and. Um, I think that they all have uh, something that we want, and we want to write about them to explore how they got what we want. And uh, I, I would say, um, well, let's see, I've written about this historical character, Marie Antoinette, whom I, I mentioned earlier. She's somebody who's generally uh, been given a very negative press. Uh, a, a good biography of her came out just as I was starting my research by Antonio Fraser, uh, who starts off by disposing of the myth of the cake business and let them eat, you know. <laughs> but um, I felt about um, Marie Antoinette that she had an enormous achievement despite her failings and shortcomings, and that was that uh, at the end of her life she knew who she was. Mm -hmm. And she knew that she was a certain kind of gracious person. When she mounted the scaffold to be beheaded, she accidentally, this is the historical record, I didn't make this up, stepped on the toe of the executioner and she stopped and said, please pardon me, I did not intend to do it. This man is about to cut off her head. But um, she had that graciousness toward people. She wanted people to feel better if they were in her presence and she knew that's who she was. And I thought that was a wonderful thing. I've always wondered about that question. Well, just who am I anyway? And you know, I seem like such a, a tremendous mess of different impulses. And so, I wrote about her to sort of learn that. And in this book, Elizabeth uh, practiced her art till she was well into her 80s and died. She practiced her art all her life, and it was her relationship to her art, despite a miserable marriage, that really made her happy. And I, I was admiring of that. So I think we come to, you could probably say the same about each yeah. of your characters. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you get to know them as characters because you have this scaffold of what is known about them. Yes. But uh, I think what I read something recently about, you know, in the span of human nature, 500 years is not a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so the, the things that pe motivate people, you know, the, the desire to do good work or the desire to be successful, or in Gutenberg's case, the incredible drive that he had to achieve this invention, which took him 20 odd years to actually bring from first idea to fruition. And he had three different businesses. He was a serial entrepreneur. As I got to think about these kind of characters, I sort of thought, 
they're very much like we are, despite this great difference in time. And, and by almost all of us have, char have, have bosses who are capricious, driven, willful characters, which is how I, I chose to characterize him based on certain things in the historical record. You know, he was fined for abusing a witness in court for, for lambasting them with you know, the you know, foulness of his language. He was sued by a woman for not marrying her when he had pledged to do so. You know, he was a pretty mercurial, difficult character. So, on the other hand, uh, I think that these are, in, you know, innate human characteristics, and it's in a way there's a freedom of exploring them in a, in a different context, in a different historical context. Well, I felt such a kinship to your book partly because both of us want to catch that moment for an artist when you see or experience a new reality, and I felt you did that so well with Peter in that passage that you were reading and, and as it goes on and as in other instances, he looks at the printed word, he feels the printed word, her Peter does, the, uh, the actual historical character, and he knows that he's seeing something that's like a miracle. Um, how can these letters, usually printed by human beings, be really just alike? And the margins are justified on the right and even a very fine scribe would find that a huge challenge to justify a margin as much as this. And it seems like magic. I mean, he's on the brink of an incredible discovery. And that's the beginning of his own shift in allegiance from his work as a scribe, of which he was very proud and very satisfied and was successful and had a future. Now he's thrown back to square one. But those wonderful moments, and, and I don't know a lot of a lot of literature that dares to try to catch that. So I, I really, I, I just thought when I read that, I thought, she's got it, she's got it, she knows that's, that's what it is. Well, I'm very interested in, you know, this whole, the, the long journey of the character, of yes. the arc of the character over the story, the, the coming of age, yes. you know. And it's interesting that your, your story is, is really about women at the end of their lives, being able to look back and to um, identify the redemptive power of art yes. in their own lives, and the fact that you know, despite the losses and the pain and the difficulties, that that art itself is an animating power. And and I think Peter shared that. You know, yes. I mean, he was a very spiritual person, and he, the creation of the Bible was the art served a divine purpose, even even though at the end. As we all know, it completely undid the Catholic Church and changed the world. Um, <laughs> only that. Only that, you know. But they don't know, I don't think, at the time. You know, who knows at the time what you're doing? You have a, you have a vague sense, you know, that, that this is different and important. And that's, as I think, partly why it's wonderful that the book has come out now, because actually now I think that we're coming to that place in our transformation where we're all a little bit you know, nervous about what it really, how is it going to change human nature? Um, yes. I, and yeah. how is it going to change human nature? I think what we're referring to, of course, is the electronic transfer of material that used to appear on the printed page. How is the electronic book? What do we do with this phenomenon? Well, Peter at first was reluctant uh, to change because he thought it lost the human touch and was mechanical in some sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, as an old-fashioned reader, I have to say that I have some resistance to reading electronically. I don't know if you do or not. When well, I was asked in one of my readings whether or not, oh, shock horror, this book existed as an e-book. And uh, when I said yes, there was an audible groan in the audience. You know, but at the same time, a lot of people have downloaded it. You know, yeah. we, we can't afford to take that posture toward no. the future. It's going to happen. No. And, and um, then you start asking philosophical questions. Okay, what is the book, actually? Is it the means through which the ideas and images are transmitted, either by scribe's hand or by the print or by the electronic image that disappears? Or is, it, uh, is the book happening in our heads? Um, mm -hmm. Any of these means can put the book into our heads. Now, I'm not, I'm not selling out on the book as book. I love the book. I've, I've loved them all my life. I used to think houses should be built of books. There's all that wall space, and why not just fill it up with books? Um, and I'm sure you, even more so, because you 
how to make books. And for me, it was very much an exploration of my own fear for the future of the book. And as a printer, you know, the tactile object that's the book. But actually, in the process of writing Peter and getting to know him, and I, I don't know about you, because it was my first novel, I wrote this many times. Yes. I wrote many, many drafts and a lot of research, too, you know, in between. Yes. Um, but I came to understand that, that one of the ways that Peter could accept this new technology was to bring to it the same degree of artistry yes. that he had experienced in the past. And, it, and as a writer, you know, you're always trying to slip in, you know, kind of meaningful things. You know, at least for me, that was an important thing that I wanted to get across, that it, we don't know what will happen, we don't know what will come, but can we please at least use the same attention to quality, the same, you know, focus, and, and it really comes back, ties in very much thematically with your work about yes. the importance of art and of artistry and, and doing good work, period. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I liked what you said earlier about um, Peter's realization that um, what they accomplished in, in printing this first Latin Bible was a team effort. And although Gutenberg had the initial spark of ideas of how print might be used in this different way. They'd all had to work together terrifically, um, and they'd been a wonderful team, and it was almost a holy experience for them all uh, working together. And um, near the end of, of Alex's book, Gutenberg, who's a great egotist, says, I did it, I did it, I could have done it without any of you, or it could have been other people who helped me, but it's really all mine. And um, so much as I appreciate the team effort, you know, that is a, a, a process of invention that um, I'm saying, well, what about ourselves writing at these books? Mm -hmm. Is that a team effort or is that an individual effort? Or what about the painter, Elizabeth Vigil Brown? Uh, so, um, I mean, it does seem to me that part of uh, the artist's life is very much one of isolation and mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there are variations on this theme of, of, of um, independence and independent uh, vision, I think, and, and the kind of teamwork. I, I thought uh, to myself, well, um, you know, I wanted to think you were right about the, the team approach, and, and uh, so I, I thought, well, you know, we are who we are because various people have nurtured us and taken care of us. Maybe the team exists in time rather than in the space of a group. In time and also in the writing, the writer's life. You know, as you mentioned, you have your readers. Um, and I have a writing group in London that I belong to. And, you know, I think it's, it's a, such an organic process of writing a novel. So I'm a journalist in my background and training. It's such an entirely different process, you know. And this process is much more a long process through time, in the way that reading a book is a, is a process through time. And time is this very important element. And the other thing I would say is that the reader is part of the process, mm -hmm. you know? So you're right, we, we, we have a variety of different influences that feed in. I mean, to me, it's an incredibly magical process writing a book, because it comes, as you say, it comes to you, it knocks on the door, it says. Uh, you know, Sometimes, other times, <laughs> other times you're chasing it down the alley saying, wait, come here, you, <laughs> you scamp. Exactly. <laughs> or just lopping off entire limbs and throwing them out because right. they're rotten. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you a special, uh, specific question about your process. Both of our books have a sort of uh, frame story. They go back and forth between two mm -hmm. times. And in the beginning, Peter is an old man who's being interviewed. Um, so that there will be a chronicle of, of what happened. And in my case, I have the contemporary writer who's written this book about mm -hmm. uh, the painter. But I was wondering where that um, uh, structure came in and your thinking about the book. From the beginning, did you know you wanted to mediate the story of Gutenberg and, and the creation of the first Bible with some sort of frame, or did it seem necessary at a certain point? It came later, it came later, because the whole process was really one of discovery, first of all, discovering the story. So there was really this long process of exploration just to figure out what happened and try to understand the, from 1450 to 1455 what happened. Yes. And then as I wrote it, it came to me actually kind of, you know, bolt out of the blue one day, maybe halfway through. I mean, it took me seven years to write this book, um, which is the exact length of a medieval apprenticeship. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And I, I, I had known about this conversation that he had had yeah. with that abbot 30 years later, and I just thought, you know, I wanted him to be able to reflect on the impact of this life-changing technology that he had been such an important part of. And also, you know, there's an emotional story that is, to me, actually the heart of it is, it's the tug of war between the young apprentice and the master who he feels betrays him in the end. Yes. And, and, and just the unresolved feelings that we all have about our parents to some extent, you know, the wounded uh, earlier self. And so he had a lot of things that I wanted him to be able to, to have an arc to learn, to, to, to look again at the past and try to understand what, why did it blow up, what happened, what was really going on. But it did come later, and that's why I think it's such a great process. I mean, you have to just stick with it, yes, and not give up. That's the hard part. Yes. I, I thought that um, that structure uh, that Alex uses worked especially well in the end game, in the end of the novel, there's the fair. Of course, we all know that this is going to turn out that they produce the Bible. If we've, you know, we've, we've heard the word Gutenberg, and we know that he was the first printer. So, in a sense, it's like writing the Marie Antoinette story, where everybody knows uh, off with their head at a right. certain point. There's, there is an advantage to having uh, that hook, in a sense, mm. pull the reader along. But in the end, you, you really interspersed um, the conversation about what happened and the, the success. And I think you were able to um, make the significance of what happened more accessible to the reader by having this retrospective look at it at the end. And it, it just seemed to move back and forth between the frame and, and the fair, which is an exciting and interesting, and it is the, the party, the culmination event. And um, I, I liked how your framework Work. Well, I have to say, it was really a lot. Of, a lot of it was just because I had a fabulous editor uh -huh. who's here tonight, who with whom I had this amazing Where creative Terry Terry Carton <laughs> from Harvard, and she, you know we had these really amazing <laughs> phone calls from London and New York, yes. in which we talked about who Peter was and you know what was happening in his heart, and and for me that was the most magical part of the whole process, aside from seeing your book in beautiful print, you know, was that yeah. you could, that someone would enter into the book with you and, and, and you could work it through. Yes. So it was, but I wanted to ask you about your structure because I found it also extremely interesting with the double strand and because Peter very consciously reflects mm -hmm. on his story, yes. I was struck by the fact that very rarely really do you allow Catherine to comment upon the story of Elizabeth that she's written. And I wondered what your intention was in terms of that mirroring that you talk about in the yes. first chapter. Is, are, as readers, is the mirroring thematic image from images? Is it uh, by the choice of the different life events that you juxtapose? Or what was your actual intent for, for making that parallel clear? Well, there are a lot of um, mirrors and mirror imagery in uh, my novel, and one instance occurs very early as a metaphor when uh, the writer, whose name is Catherine Callahan, thinks about, she's just finished writing this book, and when you just finish doing something, you ask, sometimes, you, first of all, you say, hooray, I reached the end, <laughs> but then you say, okay, what was, what was I doing? What was that all about? Did, uh, have I done any, anything worth doing? Is this worth other people's time? And um, early on in the book, she says that the piece of fiction she's written is like a mirror, although it may be speckled and modeled, uh, a distorted image of things. And then I let her realize that she wants to learn from her own mistakes. Even though she's entering an old age, she still wants to learn from what the past is, has given her. Um, but I don't let her uh, be very explicit about what she's learning from the life of the, uh, of the painter. It's really up to the reader to make a lot of those connections. Both of these women have had a hard time in their relationships to men, but they live in uh, different eras, and uh, the painter is a Catholic, and uh, she marries her husband in good faith. Her mother encourages her to make the marriage. The man is an art dealer, and being around that world is advantageous uh, to the daughter. 
But almost as soon as she's married him, she finds out he's a gambler, a spendthrift, thrift, and a womanizer. Well, <laughs> a cad. A cad. Although he's always polite to her in company, and they can entertain together and work together as a team on that way. But what happens with the painter is, I mean, she can hardly get out of this marriage at that point. Actually, she, they do have a divorce very later, not at the crucial time. They have a divorce because the revolutionaries insist that he divorce her because she fled the country. She saved her life by fleeing France uh, in 1789. That's interesting in itself. She, she fled the very night the royal family was moved from Versailles to their prison-like environments in Paris, but she had a great instinct for survival. That's one of the things that I think my character likes about her, mm -hmm. is that she was able to bounce and survive from country to country as she needed to, taking only her beloved daughter and her talent with her. The, the husband got all the money, of course. So, but anyway, she, um, I, I think, uh, uh, realizes that there's a difference in her relationship to her art and that that the painter has. The, uh, the art for the painter is a bigger thing for her than it, I think it is for the, the writer who's gone through three divorces. And um, the writer has romantic views of perfection in, in relationships, whereas the painter just steps over those mud puddles and she does what pleases her and what makes her happy. So that's a kind of... Uh, I, I guess I don't want to call it a, a, a lesson, but it's kind of observation that I hope that my character makes and that readers can make too, that there are different ways to deal with adversity. Yeah. And uh, it's important for a woman to have um, an investment in something that is her own creation, her own world. Um, well, I, I, I went back and read, read, re read Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man before yes. I read your book because I wanted, uh -huh. I was really intrigued in that, with that idea. And I really love the way that both of these women are looking back with, on the plenitude of their accomplishments. Yes. You know, and it's exactly as you say, you know, they both had a huge body of work and are fully mature. But the question you pose is really philosophical, you know, is how do you find joy? Yes. How do you is. find joy and is, is it enough? Is art enough? And, and I think you answer that question in the affirmative. And I guess what I wanted to ask you was coming off of the page in your own writing, you know, have, is, is this something that you intentionally set out to write about or did it emerge in the writing that, that actually art can provide that day-to-day you know, reason for going on. I, I do believe that art has that kind of power mm -hmm. in, in our lives, if, if we care about it and if we're the kind of person to whom it matters a great deal. Mm -hmm. And I do think one can have ecstatic spiritual relationships in, in relation to the art that speaks to you and that you love. The same thing is not going to speak to all of us. But that is a tenet of faith uh, mm -hmm. for me of the importance and power uh, of art. So I did want to celebrate that. I wanted to write about uh, the artistic process and the life of the artist. Because if you look at American literature, you know, where are the big books about artists? And where do you do, um, yeah. sort of pull this together so you all have a chance to exactly. ask us exactly. some uh, no, it's questions. I mean, I think it's one, there, it's a wonderful pairing of the books, I would say, you know, because I, I it, just, so. it just really, they both, circle around many of the same concerns, which is also kind of a great thing about historical fiction because, you know, revolutionary France, medieval Germany. Yes. It, it, I think it was Geraldine Brooks who said, you know, actually, they're no different than women. It was, she was speaking about the village that she first wrote about. Said, yes. Their concerns are no different than our concerns. Yes. And we can learn a lot by entering into their imaginary world. Yes, I thought about Geraldine Brooks and reading your, huh? your, your book. Well, she's <laughs> another journalist turned novelist. Yes. So, yeah. yes. Well, um, what would you all like to yeah. say or ask? Sharon Rosenblum, my great publicist, is here. Sharon, raise your hands so everybody can uh, see you. Thank you so much. Sharon's been with me since Ahab's wife and has wow. really been a wonderful encourager and support of everything. And let's see, are any of my other folks here? Uh, there's Joey Harris, my wonderful agent. <laughs> She's been with me before Ahab's wife. so. And I have all of my both. entire team from Harper. Oh. And my fabulous publicist. <laughs> well, you, maybe there's nobody drug. here but our team. <laughs> exactly. yes. No, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I see some people I don't know. So. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, thank you all for, for being here. Are, are there some questions? Comments? Sure thoughts? Mm -hmm. From writers. 
How many of you uh, write a bit yourselves? Do some of you? Not no. A one. No. Okay, well, wait. <laughs> so, sort of. You, you'll admit it when you're pressured. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yay. Yeah. So, um, it's really interesting to hear you talk about um, the ways in which these times that feel very distant are actually populated with people who like, love the way we do, like have fears about the future the way we do, and I think that's really true. But I'm also curious to hear you talk about the ways in which uh, these people who lived uh, a long time ago, like w what is distant from our experience and how do you handle that when you're especially writing in the first person? Um, I, I, I would take a stab at that, especially because it was, one of my interviewers told me that I had written science fiction because it was a completely alien world, and I thought that was kind of perceptive in a strange way, um, because the world of the late Middle Ages was entirely different, the consciousness of mankind was entirely different, and um, they really did believe all to a person that the divine plan ordered all of humanity and life and that every person had a place in that and even if you had free will it was still that was gift from god so you know printing actually was what changed that and allowed us to develop individuality so it was really um hard in the beginning and i was a little bit afraid that everyone would think that i was deeply religious um, but Hilary Mantel, who is my complete hero, she said at one point in a different contest that every novelist should have a Catholic childhood. And, and for her it's because she's very mystical, so she likes that whole mysticism thing. But for me it was absolutely essential. I could not have, you know, unless you understand the, a God-centered Catholic religious way of life, I don't think you could enter into that world. Um, and I thought it was important to kind of show it almost like in a snow globe, you know, the totality of this totally different world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joy? I have, yeah, here's my question. In a, a lot of writers, when they're writing historical fiction, I find are so wedded to the facts of history that they have a problem writing the novel. They are either, they're, they're defiant in holding on to the history rather than allowing your imaginations to blossom. And so how do you deal with both your respect of the historical fact and allowing yourselves to grow the fiction out? Now that's a very uh, good question. And there is something that I sometimes refer to as the tyranny of fact. And I think we have to throw off the tyranny of fact, whether we're dealing with historical material or with autobiographical material, it too has to become malleable in the hands uh, of the artist. I think in my research, I, I'm often looking for the gaps. I'm always looking for motivation. Why does the person want to do this? How do they feel about what they're doing? And while the facts are there historically and they have to link together, how, how does a character move from feeling one way about things to another way about things? And in Alex's uh, novel, Peter is very resentful that his father calls him back from Paris and wants him to give up this life as a scribe that he's worked very hard at. But he eventually um, falls in love with his new project and he becomes grateful that he might say that, that God has taken him in another uh, direction. But there is when you just know those two facts, that he was once a scribe and now he's something else, then you say, okay, how does he feel about this change? And it's not there on the record, so you have to imagine something uh, plausible yeah. for that. And I think it's true, too, and I think that I, as a journalist, had that problem specifically. And um, partly, in, that may be why it took me so long to write the novel, because in a way I felt like I had to learn everything, and then I had to unlearn everything. And the thing I really think is that our notion of history is also, it is just a story, you know? And what comes down the, through the historical record as fact is very often not. Particularly in the case of Gutenberg, you know, what I discovered was this whole other story that nobody had ever talked about. And, and so I, I didn't treat the facts with so much reverence, I think. I felt like, and there were huge gaps. I mean, you could drive a truck through the graphs that I had, so it was great, you know? And it really was, we, like you said, you know, we know Marie Antoinette 
was head beheaded. We know the Bible exists. It's not about how, about what, it's about how. Mm -hmm. How did they get there? And that's pure imagination. And what does it mean to us and to the other people who were in the experience and to the um, major yeah. actors them, themselves? What do their lives mean to them? Exactly. And that's speculation and imagination yeah. is entering into the heart of the character. And, and I do write that way of trying to imagine myself inside uh, mm -hmm. the characters. Yeah, very, very much so. Who else has a question? I thought about all of this. Yes. Well, I, I just want to say I had read the novel months ago when it was starting to read it. I immediately thought of Hilary Mantel's work and, uh, and thought that what you did was as accomplished as what I've read from her. Um, well, I think what's even more interesting, yeah, it's funny you mentioned science fiction because that's something I'm interested in. Huh. And uh, in many respects, what they were living through, Gutenberg and, and his colleagues, is very reminiscent with today because they're dealing with the collapse of a, a, a great empire that's being besieged by Islam and they're feeling the effects of that. And by that, I'm talking about the Byzantine Empire. It's yep. being fresh the fall of by, by, yes. by the Ottomans. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it was fun while I was writing it. You know, I thought about the Twin Towers. You know, this, I think when you're writing, it's what we were talking about earlier, you know, everything is grist when you're a writer. And, and you know, little parallels pop up and they, they, they weave their way in, in in conscious and unconscious ways, I think. You know? yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was another event here last week where there were so two people who had written novels set in the past, but both of them were very eager to tell us although one of them had a PhD in history, and they insisted that they were not doing historical fiction. They were writing novels that happened to be set in the past that we should not understand that what they were doing was historical fiction. Neither of you has demurred about the historical fiction phrase. <laughs> well, you know, I actually um, was asked to write uh, my top 10 historical fiction books, and I kind of had to admit to myself that I don't read very much historical fiction. And it's true that there's been a shift in the kind of historical fiction that's being written. And it's being, um, Marguerite Bursenau said a really nasty thing about sort of bodice rippers set in Regency House. You know, she said it was like bad, a bad costume ball, you know. And I think there is that type of writing, but there are a lot of very serious writers who are writing literary stories that happen to be set in the past. And, you know, maybe they're highbrow and lowbrow, I don't know, you know. Well, I think so. There's a lot of um, bad historical fiction where the characters speak like modern people, and, and yet s some people have no ear and they're not able to distinguish between artful writing set in a historical place and writing that is just uh, using the fame of the characters in some way. So, uh, um, I, you know, I can understand resistance <laughs> to mm -hmm. historical fiction. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of very bad, popular stuff. We'll ask you after who it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sure, one last question. There must yes. be. I saw a hand back there, I think. No? No? Well, I want to say how nice it has been to be here with you all. Thank you so much uh, for coming out this evening to hear us talk. We, we love to talk about her. <laughs> we will. We can. <laughs> more, more, more. There are many more pages to read. It's, it's a great honor to be here at the Center for Fiction, and I so much appreciate being invited to be involved in this. Thank you, and I really enjoyed our pairing. I thought it was a great idea. So thank you again. Thank you.